Prejudice comes in many forms. The word itself means prejudge. I'm Brian Patrick. We're looking at prejudices, more specifically racial prejudice, with special guest Deacon Larry Oney from the Archdiocese of New Orleans, this time on Crossing the Goal. We are kicking off our show on prejudices this time on Crossing the Goal. Here's our Crossing the Goal team. Peter Herbeck, Vice President of Renewal Ministries. From Focus, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. Curtis Martin, the founder and president. And the former All-Pro wide receiver and NFL coach, Danny Abramowitz. And Curtis, let's look at prejudice as Catholics. You know, this is very important because it touches on what it means to be Catholic. The church is a project of God, and the project has two fundamental tasks. It's to reunite each individual with God, but it's also to reunite one another in Christ. And this is what the Catechism says in article number one. It says, God calls together all men scattered and divided by sin into the unity of his family, the church. I'm excited about this topic because it's essential to becoming what the church is supposed to be. Yeah, and it's important for us to be able to see racism for what it is, racial prejudice. I saw a definition recently by the U.S. bishops from back in 1979. It says, racism is a sin. Racism is the sin that says some human beings are inherently superior and others essentially inferior because of race. Racism remains, I think, a deep national wound. We've made some progress, but we have a long way to go, and the church needs to lead the way to bring healing to this problem. Way, way, way too much division. And uh, yeah. you, you think about it, white, black, black, white, black, brown, black, black. You know, we, we've, it's time to stop all this stuff, really. If you really think about it and respect one of uh, the dignity of each person, then we'll be able to come to a conclusion and finish all this racism. We are focusing on racial prejudice and Coach Danny will introduce us to his friend from the Archdiocese of New Orleans, Deacon Larry Oney, next in the game plan here on Crossing the Goal. Welcome to The Game Plan. I'm Danny Abramowitz, and I want to introduce you to my good friend, Deacon Larry Oney. Larry, you, Larry. welcome aboard, man. Thank you Give very you a much. hug here, bro. Good to be here with you. Yeah, well, let's start off. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, as you know, I'm, I'm from the New Orleans Diocese. I'm a deacon there. I'm a father. I have five children, four boys and a daughter. And I'm a business person as well, so I've got a lot going on there in the Archdiocese of New Orleans. And you have a lovely wife. I know me and my wife, Claudia, are <laughs> very good friends with her, and you are really blessed, buddy. I am. <laughs> Andy's my heart. She's a beautiful woman, a woman of God, so I'm thankful to the Lord for Andy. You know, you're an active person. People don't realize the deacon's got a lot going on. Plus, you have a wonderful business. I mean, a very big business, but you're also active in ministry. And in fact, I think you're even writing a book, aren't you? That's right. Uh, deacons are busy people. We're in the marketplace. I mean, we don't spend all of our time in church. We're out touching the people. I do have a business, about 350 employees. I, I assume that most of them are working while I'm here today. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. we're making a little money. Yeah. But uh, involved in the church, I, I'm blessed that... It, I'm assigned to the cathedral in New Orleans in historic yeah. French Quarter, New Orleans. I'm also assigned to another small church at the western end of the diocese. So there's a, there's a lot to do. Yes, and your wife went into the church and became... Well, That's right. My, my, my wife, uh, it's a predominantly African-American church at the, the smaller church where I minister, and my wife has single-handedly integrated the church. She's the only white person <laughs> in the church there. <laughs> And that's going pretty well. There's been no marchers or anything. They, good, they love good, her. Yeah, yeah. It's very well. You're controlling that situation pretty good. Well, I hope yeah. God is controlling it no, all with me. Yes. Right. Well, let's talk about this prejudice thing and, and focus more on racial prejudice. What, what's that all about? You know, Danny, it's a hard thing for people to talk about, about yeah. prejudice. But the reality is we do have prejudice and racism in our country. Uh, so some people are unclear about what's the difference between prejudice and racism. To, you might prefer a car or a Ford, and I might prefer a Chevrolet, no harm done. But racial prejudice is when one group of people feel that their race is superior to another. That's a serious issue. Uh, it's a sin, frankly, and it causes a, it's a cause of a lot of problems in our nation as you and I speak right now. 
Yes. In fact, uh, you, you've dealt with this personally in, 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 in your life. It's not like something you read about or something. You experience it with your own life. And that's exactly right. I, I'm not proud of it, but uh, when I came up, I, was, I didn't like white people. I mean, I really didn't understand the whole genesis of how did I get to that point, but there was definitely hatred there, if you want to call it racism. I didn't feel like I was superior to anybody, but I definitely didn't like white people for a lot of reasons. Uh, some of them economic. I can only share about my own personal experience. I mean, I'm not an expert on uh, race relations, but yes. race for me was, uh, it, it overwhelmed my life for a good part of my life. You, you didn't learn this in your family. In fact, your, your mama, she didn't want any parts of it, did she? That's right. My mom would not, she, she wouldn't go there, wouldn't let us go there. We couldn't talk bad about white folk. We couldn't say those kinds of things. But we were we were face-to-face uh, uh, -face with the reality, though, of racism every day in our lives. As we worked in different parts of town, as we uh, uh, worked in our own community, race was a big factor. And racism and open and blatant discrimination was a part of our lives as well. Right. How did you work your way out of this thing? I'd like to say that I worked my way out of it, but I can only say that God in His grace helped me to get through it. Faith really, uh, when you think about Christ in your life and in my life, it's incompatible with hating people for whatever right. reason. Right. You, you can't justify it. And I got to the point where I couldn't justify it either. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying that everything is beautiful and wonderful, yeah, right. but I am saying that faith and Christ is the key because you can't love God and hate your brother. And this took a, quite a long time. How long were you involved with this? A few years, about 27 of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, and, and you know, in my book, which is called Amazing Grace, yeah. Overcoming Race, uh, somebody nice. asked me about the title. I said, well, why didn't Amazing Grace overcome race? Because we're still overcoming. The yeah. battle is still on. Yes. Uh, racism is still what I believe is one of the battlefronts in spiritual warfare. Our brothers cannot hate another brother that looks right. different than them. I should not hate you, Danny, because you're, my son tan is better than yours. Right. I mean, I'm you know, trying to catch up, but I, know I, can, you are. I can't. Yes. So, I mean. But listen, you can't, you, you, racism has no place <laughs> no. as a brother Absol and the Lord. Absolutely. Can't and be. You and I are proof of that. You know, look at our Amen. relationship and you know, we don't look at each other with black and white. We just as man to man, you know, type of thing. Amen. What, what's your advice to some people out there that are facing this in their life? Well, the scripture is clear, resist the devil, because racism is evil. If you resist him, he'll flee. But when guys are gathered around the water cooler, don't buy into it. When they send you a joke or something by email that's supposed to be funny, that has racial overtones, that demeans anybody, destroys anybody's dignity, delete. Don't read it, don't forward it on. And if you're around people like that, you, isn't it best to just get away from it? Absolutely, absolutely. But sometimes we have to speak and be clear that it's not okay in my home for anybody to talk about white people. It's not okay in your home for anybody to talk about black people. I know that about you. See, I would have no problem being in your home, Danny, because right. I know that you stand for right. brotherhood and equality. Right. We have to resist it. We have to speak clearly about race and racism. Amen, brother. Amen. Brian. Thanks, Coach. Deacon Larry. You guys ready to hit the red zone? Let's do this. Yeah, you know yeah. what the coach says, if we're waiting on him, we're backing up. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. In the red zone on Crossing the Goal, talking about prejudices, specifically racial prejudice. Our guest is Deacon Larry Oney with the Archdiocese of New Orleans. And you and Peter also mentioned this, that, that racism is a sin. This is serious business. It is. I mean, race, racism is a sin because it means that if we think that one group of people are superior to another, that means we won't respect the dignity of that other group of people. So it is a sin. And that's a teaching from the church, that, that my personal opinion, or Peter's, yeah, so right. that's the reality of it. Yeah. Well, Larry, we've, you know, the country's talked about racism for so long, and people, people have genuinely made great efforts at trying to stem the problem. 
in your view, are we making any real progress and where do you see it and how do you see it? I think we have to concede that we're making some progress. Let's be frank here. Uh, there was a time when black people could not, and, and, and I know there's other forms of race, racism, yeah. but I'm talking about black people right. and their experience right. in America. Right. But there was a time when I couldn't make this trip here to Birmingham to do this show because <laughs> I had to stay with people that I knew because I couldn't stay in a hotel. And we're yeah. on a show that's a worldwide show talking about race. Yeah. Of course we've that's made progress. progress. Yeah. We have to admit that. Yeah. But I need to be quick to say there's a lot more that we need to do. There's mm -hmm. still subtlety in racism. There's still uh, uh, situations where it's not right. It's not right. Mm -hmm. Things are not right mm -hmm. uh, from one race to another. And the dignity of our personhood of all people is, is not respected. Yeah, it's true. I'm sure we can all think of examples like that. Yeah, but sure. it's, it, we've made progress, but we still have a long way to go. Yeah. And we don't have many people of color in the Catholic Church. Is there anything we can do to improve that? Well, uh, we need to improve our preaching for one thing. I was going to yeah. say, yeah. <laughs> Very good preaching. point. Well, music preaching would be willing to stay longer. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Those things would help. Yeah. But I, also, I think, before somebody can be evangelized, they first, we have to make a friend before we could make a disciple. That's right. So we have to, we have to get out of our comfort zone and try and reach people personally. That's, what, that's how I was evangelized. Somebody befriended me then share the gospel of Christ with me. That's what comes first. Make a friend, be a friend, and bring a friend to Christ. Amen. Yeah. You think it's, uh, you, you experience it also in the business world? I mean, you're, you've got a big thriving business. Do you see it in there? Absolutely, Danny. I mean, it's, it's very subtle. People have this idea, some people have the idea that, well, if you're a black person or a, or a person of color or a minority person that, oh, you get these free contracts, right? Trust me, it's not like that. <laughs> yeah. It's not like that. You have to compete. And then also... I didn't know that. You didn't know that. <laughs> no, I mean, listen, right. the reality is it's tougher yeah. if you're a minority person. We have to deal with that reality. And, and the beginning of it is to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And business is even tougher. Because remember, for a lot of black people, we're first generation business people. So yeah. we don't have 20, 30, 40 years worth of history Good and point. relationships to leverage off of. And networks, existing networks of people that already Absolutely. know you're in trust. Yeah. You know, I think if Peter has shared with his family, you've got a, a, a part of your family are Jewish, and you see the wonderful network that you have within yeah. the Jewish community that have learned over generations to trust one another. And I think we have to recognize what do we do to help ramp people up, uh, people of color, anybody who's trying to uh, come into uh, business, because that's one of the things that makes this nation great, is you can actually come from anywhere and, and rise into leadership and, and into wealth and to be able to have some great things happen, but we need to figure out how do we help. I'd, I'd love to ask a question. I mean, can you give us an example of one or two things that have been very, very helpful in your life? Because you mentioned that you went from a place where you were um, struggling against whites, and now obviously you're, you've got a whole ministry, both to blacks and to whites. What are some moments in your life that have been meaningful? Well, again, somebody evangelized me. I remember we were crossing the Mississippi River, and remember, there. I'm going back now 20 some years now, this one guy, a white guy, stopped and shared the gospel with me. I mean, I was unevangelized. He simply came up to me and said, Jesus has been looking for you. I'm thinking, he has been? <laughs> he, he shared the good news with me. I mean, that really happened. Yeah. But I remember another time when we were younger, God always sends people into your life. Yeah. Uh, doing a good deed for a person, no matter what they look like, has a tremendous impact. I remember in, in my family where somebody who didn't look like us did a good deed. They brought food when we were in need of food. Mm -hmm. And now we had to reconcile this issue of uh, white people are not that nice. See, that, that was a prejudice we have, and we felt yeah. totally justified in that yeah. because some weren't very nice. Sure. Yeah. But this person made us deal with this kind act and our own attitude about race. And that's, that's part of what I'm writing in the book, Amazing Grace, Overcoming Grace. But my faith was coming too. So one example is somebody, not afraid that I look different than him, shared the good news of Jesus Christ. And we have to be open too. Yes. Because as we're open for that, we never know what God wants to do. Yes. God may have a miracle in store if we'll step out of our comfort zone and share with people. There's That's so many right. barriers out here, but you know, I'm proud to be a part of an industry that I think has really knocked down the barriers, and that's athletics. Yes. Uh, the NFL, you see in so many minority coaches, and uh, you look at sports in general. Don't you feel that athletics has probably been the lead force in breaking down racism? Absolutely. I mean, I can remember my own uh, uh, entry into sports and junior high school and high school. I mean, the first time I saw up close actually 
uh, was involved with somebody that looked different to me in sports was in junior high school. Uh, it was an amazing thing because it was a whole, uh, it was another world. Yeah. But sports is kind of an equalizer, Dan, as you know. Yes. If you've got the best talent, you're going to play because yeah. coaches want to win. Exactly. So it, it, there's, there's very little discrimination there. Exactly. So uh, if, if life was like that, uh, of course, it's not nice and neat like that, but sports has been a great, done a great yes. job at helping to break down some of those barriers. The entertainment yeah. industry is similar, you know. I mean, if Denzel's yeah. going to make me 20 million or your 100 million dollars, he's the guy. I'll take him. You know, absolutely. What I mean? That's and don't absolutely. you think that you know, as close as athletes get, especially on the same team, you know, they they go to camp together, they room together, they they really spend a lot of time. Don't you think they have an opportunity to get to know each other as people instead of as someone different? Totally agree, Brian, and that's part of what. I believe that we need to do as a society. We have to get to know people. We have to invite different people into our lives, put down our barriers, d talk frankly about race and racism, yeah. and then be open for a new experience with different people. Yeah, because we talked about prejudice being prejudging, judging someone before we know them. Yeah. You know, that yes. can't be right. No, it, it I th cannot. I, I think what you see in some of these structured environments like sports is you've got let's say just for our conversation, whites and blacks coming together who normally may not come together, but they have a common goal. They all want to be football players. They all want to make a lot of money. They want to be famous. So we'll, we'll, we'll work together. We'll overcome those initial fears. I think there's a lot of fear because of that prejudice that goes on a false idea. Like not too many white folks feel confident just walking down the streets and put some parts of Detroit, knocking on the door and say, hi, can I come out and visit? You know, and so, you know what I'm saying? To yes. establish some kind of relationship because there's fear there. And you fear, you fear what you don't understand and you don't know. And I think, how, how do ordinary people overcome some of those boundaries? Well, look, there are some parts of New Orleans that I won't walk down, or probably Detroit as well. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. common sense. Yeah. Right. I'm talking about where there's a structural situation that uh, is a barrier for people to enter. That's, mm -hmm. that's racism, where one group puts up a barrier for other people to succeed in business yeah. and otherwise. As far as uh, 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 using common sense, I think it's a good thing to do that, yeah. always. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think there's a problem there. But uh, uh, hopefully I can, I can touch on this for a minute. I'm sitting yeah. here in Birmingham, Alabama. There was, uh, Dr. King made a great statement. He said, when the dignity of one man is threatened anywhere, then the dignity of every man yes. is threatened everywhere. Right, right. Man, that sounds like the catechism. It's basically saying, we can't have anybody whose dignity and personhood is being disrespected anywhere. So I guess what I would say is, if we want to do something to put racism down, guard the dignity of our brothers, mm -hmm. no matter what they look like. No, Deacon Larry, that really touches on one of the things we always try to stress, and the catechism lays stress on this, and that is that G sometimes we talk about Jesus dying for all of us, and that's certainly true, but really the, the, the biblical teaching is a little bit more subtle than that. Jesus did die for all of us, but he died for each of us, each yes, and every one of us. us. Yeah. And we're told in the catechism, and St. Paul references this when he says, Christ died for me, that Jesus was thinking about each and every one of us, regardless of race or, or circumstances. And we have to recognize that he was thinking about people we don't think we're in, we're in communion with. Well, wait a minute, he's in communion, he's the bridge. Yes. Yes. And so it really is loyalty to Christ to address Amen. this. And I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have this conversation because we have a long way to go. Thank God for where yeah. we've gone, but we have a long way to go. We do. In closing, I know we're getting to the end, but this, I think this is important. We have to break this, sever this. You know, just like me in, in my drinking, I had to stop this and break the chain, and it, and it happened. In our families, that's where it's got to start, yes. with the father and the mother. Mm -hmm. And in my house, I can say this, uh, apparently I must have done a decent job in this. My <laughs> children, which our youngest one is going to be 40 here, so we have three in their 40s, I have never, ever heard them one time come with a racial slur or talk anything bad about another a person of another color. My so, mother would not allow it at all no. in our house. It, it, and that's don't you think do. that's where it has to that be? That has to yes. be. I mean, that's what we're teaching our eight-year-old son. Listen, he doesn't know anything. and He only knows what we teach him. Our children right. know what we teach them, mm -hmm. bottom line. And it's the same goes for race and racism. Whatever. If we teach our yeah. children, all will be well. Well, thank you, Deacon Larioni. We appreciate what you've shared with us. And in spite of the fact that you're Danny's friend, we're really glad to have you here. We were a little wondering about your judgment. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I'm doing my Different part. type of prejudgment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll be in the end zone next. These guys will get the last word on prejudice here on Crossing the Goal.
we've moved into the end zone, we really appreciate Deacon Larry Oney and his insight into prejudice. Let's get the last word from our team members here on prejudice. Peter? Uh, Brian, I think one of the biggest things is I've been just prayerfully going through the show is, is realizing how deeply offensive racism is to the heart of God. This is just not the heart of Jesus, and it's a sin, and the Lord wants to change our hearts because He loves us. And so I'd ask each and every one of us to really examine our hearts before the Lord and ask the Lord to give us His heart for all the brethren. Well, I thought Deacon Larry was really amazing. Jesus makes a very amazing statement himself. He says, they will know you're my disciples because of the love you have for one another. He didn't mean love that you have for one another that happen to look like you. This is actually something that is a, a biblical and, and an evangelical imperative for us as men. We have to get serious about this. We have to take leadership and say, we've got to love people whether they look like us or not because Christ died for each of us. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, guys, wow, that was, that was something special, I think. Uh, and I think this is a great opportunity to really reflect in our own lives, each of us, and find out, do we have prejudice in our heart? Are we racist? I, I think if you really look and say, I, I know you don't want to, I know I don't, to really think and reflect and say, you know, if I do have any, I, I want to change it. Lord, change my heart, and He will. Thanks, Coach. We're looking forward to reading Deacon Larry's book, Amazing Grace, Overcoming Race. When it comes out, you can find information on our website, along with resources, DVDs of Crossing the Goal shows, and questions you can download that go along with the DVD for your small group. Next time on Crossing the Goal, we're going to have Curtis's son, Brock, with us. That's right. Looking forward to that. Pretty excited. <laughs> yeah. He is a, a student at Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. Christian life in college. Next time on Crossing the Goal.